good morning. We are reading An Open Heart by the Dalai Lama. We're on the start of, this is the first part, because this is the start of chapter two. Uh, it's very early in the morning, I'm very tired, so you're going to have to bear with me. This chapter is called The Desire for Happiness. Uh, it is my hope that the reader of this small book will take away basic understanding of Buddhism and some of the key methods by which Buddhist practitioners have cultivated compassion and wisdom in their lives. The methods discussed in the following chapters have been taken from three sacred texts of Buddhism. Kama, Kamala Shila was an Indian who helped develop and clarify the practice of Buddhism in Tibet. His work, Middle Length Stages of Meditation, contains the essence of all Buddhism. Tongmei Sangpo's The 37 Practices of Bodhisattvas and Langri Tangpa's Eight Verses on Training the Mind. I really like Geshe Langri Tangpa. He is hardcore. They have also been drawn up in the preparation of this book, been drawn upon in the preparation of this book. I would like to stress at the outset that one doesn't have to be Buddhist to make use of these meditation techniques. In fact, the techniques themselves do not lead to enlightenment or a compassionate and open heart. That's up to you, the effort and the motivation to bring your spiritual practice. The purpose of spiritual practice is to fulfil our desire for happiness. We are all equal in wishing to be happy and to overcome our suffering. And I believe that we all share the right to fulfil this aspiration. When we look at the happiness we seek and the suffering we wish to avoid, most evident are the pleasant and unpleasant feelings we have in result of our sensory experience of the taste, smells, texture, sounds and forms that we perceive around us. There is, however, another level of experience. True happiness must be pursued on the mental level as well. <clears throat> If we compare the mental and physical levels of happiness, we find that the experience of pain and pleasure that take place mentally are actually more powerful. For example, though we may find ourselves in a very pleasant environment, if we are mentally depressed or if something is causing us profound concern, we will hardly notice our surroundings. On the other hand, if we have inner mental happiness, we find it easier to face our challenges or other adversity. This suggests that our experiences of pain and pleasure at the level of our thoughts and emotions are more powerful than those felt on the physical plane. Oh. I don't know. It can be a bit of both sometimes, can't it? As we analyse our mental experiences, we recognise that the powerful emotions we possess such as desire, hatred and anger, tend to not bring us very profound or long-lasting happiness. Fulfilled desire may provide a sense of temporary satisfaction. However, the pleasure we experience upon acquiring a new car or a new home, for example, is usually short-lived. I have to agree with this, because since being on this coronavirus, I do this thing where we order some food or some shit off the internet because we can't go out. And then we wait for it to arrive, and I'm like waiting. And then it arrives, and then within a few seconds, I'm like, well, whatever. So it's short lived indeed. When we indulge our desires, they tend to increase in intensity and multiply in number. We become more demanding and less confident. Oh, less content, sorry. We become more demanding and less content, finding it more difficult to satisfy our needs. In the Buddhist view, hatred, anger and desire are all afflictive emotions, which simply means they tend to cause us discomfort. The discomfort arises from the mental unease that follows the expression of these emotions. A constant state of mental unsettledness can even cause us physical harm. Where do these emotions come from? According to the Buddhist worldview, they have their roots in habits cultivated in the past. They are said to have accompanied us from past lives 
when we experienced and indulged in similar emotions. If we continue to accommodate them, they will grow stronger, exerting greater and greater influence over us. Spiritual practice, then, is a process of taming these emotions and diminishing their force. For ultimate happiness to be attained, they must be removed totally. We also possess a web of mental response patterns that have been cultivated deliberately, established by means of reason for, or as a result of cultural conditioning. Ethics, law, religion, beliefs are all examples of how our behaviour can be channelled by external st structures. Initially, the positive emotions derived from cultivating our higher natures may be weak, but we can enhance them through constant familiarity, making our experience of happiness and inner contentment far more powerful than a life abandoned to purely impulsive emotions. I mean, well, I suppose that's what we're doing to our kids, trying to help them deal with their impulses and stuff. And as adults, adults we should really be able to... Um, to a certain degree, it's kind of like the code of an adult, isn't it, to keep your emotions in check. Ethical discipline and understanding the way things are. As we further examine our more impulsive emotions and thoughts, we find that on top of disturbing our mental peace, they tend to involve mental projections. What does this mean exactly? Projections bring about the powerful emotion, emotional interaction between ourselves and external objects. Mental projections, what does this mean exactly? Projections bring about the powerful emotion interaction between ourselves and external objects, people or things we desire. For example, when we are attracted to something, we tend to exaggerate its qualities, seeing it as 100% good or 100% desirable. And we are filled with the longing for that object or person. <coughs> An exaggerated projection, for example, might lead us to feel that a newer, more up-to-date computer could fulfil all our needs and solve all our problems. Well, not maybe all of our problems, but a right good 102% of them, because flipping hell, my computer, what a banger. However, they're just my computer problems that I'll sort out. Similarly, if we find something undesirable, we tend to distort its qualities in the other direction. Aversion is something that I'm dealing with a lot at the moment. Once we have our heart set on a new computer, the old one that served us so well for many years suddenly begins to take on questionable, objectionable qualities, acquiring more and more deficiencies. Our interaction with this computer becomes more and more tainted by these projections. Again, this is true for people as it is for material possessions. A troublesome boss or a difficult associate is seen as possessing a naturally flawed character. We make a similar aesthetic judgment of objects that do not meet our fancy, even if they are perfectly acceptable to others. So this is what we're trained in though, isn't it? Like as a teenager, all of this, being able to have our personality. I don't like, you know, rock music, but I'm really into indie music. And some of this is just your natural um, pull. But I suppose he's saying it's, it's okay to do that, have a natural pull towards something. It's just if you start exaggerating, it's, it's, um, it's good qualities. And I suppose he's just trying to shine a light on how we respond to stuff. As we contemplate the way in which we project our judgments, whether positive or negative, upon people as well as objects and situations, we can begin to appreciate that more, res more reasoned re emotions and thoughts are more grounded in reality. This is because a more rational thought process is likely to be influenced by projections. This is because a more rational thought process is likely to be influenced by, is less likely to be influenced by projections. Such a mental state more closely reflects the way things actually are, the reality of the situation, 
I therefore believe that cultivating a correct understanding of the way things are is critical for our quest for happiness. Alright, this is full on. I need to think about some of this. Okay, bye.